Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this afternoon I'm joined by John Hughes and Patrick McGilp. We have been streaming on a daily basis live at 12.30 now for almost three and a half years. This is the first time, and we've covered every game in that period, live, before, during and after the game. This is the first time I've ever had to try and uh, have a look at and dismantle and pick the bones of a 6-0 defeat. John Hughes, the first thing I think we talk about is the fan base. They've been mugged off last night. That's the first thing. People talk about dead rubbers in Europe. For me, if you've got a fan base who are paying their money and taking days off their work and being away from their family to go and watch Celtic, they deserve better last night. That that was that was not acceptable. Uh, they deserve infinitely better than that. Um, it, and it's not a small thing. You know, people are not. You know, you're going away. You're taking time off your work, so you're not getting paid for that, right? Or you're taking holiday entitlement, which is very scarce for most people. Uh, you're then paying quite substantial sums in flights, boats, trains, whatever it may be to get there. Um, and if you're not going to slum it, it's going to cost you uh, a, a good few quid in accommodation as well. And you, you're doing all that with the sort of contact with the, the, the club, really, that they will do our best, they will do their best, and we will do our best. Yes. Uh, and... I believe the fans have consistently done their best to the point where if you are looking at it objectively, you know, purely in Europe we're talking about here, but if you're looking at it objectively, uh, how do you justify that to another person in your life? To like, you know, let's say you've got a missus, you know, or a mister or whatever it is, but how do you justify that? So you're going away, you're spending a fortune, you're absolutely miserable, you come back miserable, um, and uh, it hasn't done anything to improve. <laughs> You've just had a, a pretty rough go of it. Uh, and, you know, so the, fan, the fans are absolutely doing their best, especially in light of our Champions League away record, which is beyond abysmal, beyond a joke. Um, and then last night, which is just embarrassing. I, I was watching it back this morning. I didn't want to watch it back. I was watching back. Did you actually do that? That's massive. Uh, well, I didn't watch the game. I watched <laughs> the goals. But do you, know what, do you know what it is? You get to 3 0 and you think, it's another three to go. I know. Do you know what? It's, it's horrific. And uh, no, I, I feel heart sorry for all those people last night that took time and money and, um, you know, relationship credits out of their lives. Uh, to go away and do that, uh, yeah. and uh, that's what they were. Look, I mean, there's there's obviously you know there's always extenuating circumstances, but this is the thing: there's always extenuating circumstances. Um, there's always excuses when you seek to look for them, uh, but there is pattern of results that are just undeniable, and there has been for quite some time. And uh, so, fair play to the fans. I understand. We all understand that excitement. Oh, we can have it. Can't wait, can't wait to go over, can't wait to go with the lads or, you know, whoever it is that you're going with. And it's exciting and, it, you know, it's something to really look forward to. But then when you get there and, you know, we leak a goal in six and then they send it off. And for all intents and purposes, there's not a person in that stadium that didn't know the game was over at that point. You know, so you, you, you're there and you've travelled all that way and you get 20 minutes of entertainment. Um, and then, you know, you get, <laughs> excuse me, uh, the rest of the game is just masochism. Mm. And again, I don't blame people pointed, uh, people pointed this out, the guys leaving early. I don't blame people for leaving early. You're going to be kettled for an hour, yeah. 45 yeah. minutes to an hour after the game. You're going to be standing there like a mug after just getting pumped 6-0. So if people want to leave, have spent all that money, that is up to them. Uh, because realistically, nobody believed for a second we were getting anything out of that uh, at, at that point. So if they want to go, that's their prerogative. Uh, I'm not going to preach to people about how long they should stay in a game when they've spent a fortune and all that time getting to that game uh, and doing their bit. They did their bit. They got there. You know, it wasn't them. They made a horlicks of it. Um, so... You know, I, I, I just look, at, you know, again, it's very frustrating. It's, it's difficult not to be angry this morning. 
because uh, these are similar frustrations that, that we've had before. Uh, angry and a bit embarrassed. You know, that's the kind of yeah. pumping that you know we hope never to see. And I don't care whether we compete to win this thing or not, but we have to be able to put out a team that doesn't get pumped 6-0. And I don't care if they've got 10 men. Uh, you know, that's uh, 6-0 is, uh, you know, and it's, it's not the first time it's happened. Um, uh, but the, the the thing about it was, in the past, we, we've had excuses as well. We haven't had the finances, all the rest of it. Uh, but we have now. We, we had enough money and enough resources to put a team on that pitch that would not give up six goals uh, and uh, people at the club decided not to do that. So I, I feel bad for the fans. Uh, as I say, they've kept their side of the contract. The club has not. See, this is a thing, John. We're not sitting here absolutely delusional saying that we want to spend enough money where we're competing at the later stages of this competition. That is beyond... You know, that is beyond where Celtic are in terms of our finance, the game that we play, the country we play in. We know that. But we need to do better than last night. This is the thing. Because if you don't and the board continue um, to rinse and repeat, then it's quite clear that we're only there to pick up the cheque. Now, I I remember speaking on an away uh, trip to someone in the the hotel foyer who uh, was counting their away trips and there were over 100. So there's... John, you know, it becomes part of people's lives and their yeah. plans every single season, regardless of which European tournament we're in, they're going to be going to three, four, five, whatever, however many games. And there are actual contributors and ex-contributors who are amongst that kind of group. Declan McConville was there last night, Natasha Miko. I know that Patrick's been to a few away days himself. And yeah, it, you know, the experience is part of the culture of uh, fans who go to away games to do their away days. Absolutely, I get it. Totally get that. But yeah, if they want to leave at any point uh, due to the, the desperate nature of our performance, then go for it. You know, they should not be criticised yeah. in any way, shape or form. And I actually think, Patrick, as fans, those who were there last night, us sitting here, I think we deserve better than what was served up last night. We'll get into the nuances of the game, things we could have done better, specifically last night. But I think there's wider range, ranging questions to be to be asked here. And I think, first and foremost, the, the fans deserve better communication. We don't know what the aspirations are of this board. Do they want just to be in the tournament like a tourist, pick up the cheque, as I say, go in again next year knowing that we're not armed for it? That's what the tagline's about. This was this was a comment last night. We've gone into that, that gunfight last night armed with a water pistol. That's what it felt like. And we capitulated. We didn't capitulate against Feyenoord. You can maybe argue that different level of opposition down to nine men, but we capitulated last night and the quality was not there and that was all for, for all to see. Not just us as fans, but all across Europe, Patrick, that was for all to see. The quality just wasn't there, was it? No, um, it was embarrassing. And I think we've all known really since the summer that the summer wasn't good enough, the recruitment wasn't good enough. And I don't think, as you say, no one's expecting us to go to Athletic away and you know, win the game. I think that'd be fanciful for us to expect that. No one's expecting us to win the Champions League. But I feel as if we're constantly underperforming a certain standard that we all expect. We're expecting a bit of pride when we go away in Europe, not losing 6 7 nothing. And you look back through previous Champions League seasons and you've got 7 nothing Barcelona, 7-1 PSG, um, 5-1 Real Madrid. It's becoming a a bit too common um, for everyone's liking. And Again, I'm not expecting to go to the Bern about the new camp and win the game, but you know, try and keep a bit of pride about the club and about the team. Um, and then in other games, you know, that Lazio home game, that was a poor side. And I think if we signed two or three more players, we could have won that game. We could be sitting in four points, and we could still be within a chance of progressing. Um, and I think you know, it's hard to pinpoint who's responsible, but there's people at the club who their expectations are obviously lower than what the fans expect and the fans are pouring in you know 500 quid for a season ticket uh, 50 quid a game for the Champions League you know God knows how people afford to go to every single away game in European away game I mean it, it must be hundreds and hundreds of pounds to get to, to go to all three of those games only to see us lose and lose heavily and um, you know we've been speaking about it since the results were released you know you've got 72 million in profit as of the 30th of June 
and yet we're getting humped in Europe. We're not investing the money that we have. And as you say, there's no communication. We don't know what the intentions are with that money. We're hoping, we're thinking it might be infrastructure, maybe improving the stadium, maybe improving training facilities. Barrafield's going to take up a big chunk of money, but you're sitting there with a team that we know isn't good enough to compete at the level we want to be. And um, there's people responsible for that who are still at the club. Oh, absolutely. And I was saying just before we came on there that um, it is gotten a, a performance like that has absolutely gotten Barcelona turned us over, like you say, Patrick. PSG done it twice. Real Madrid done it last season. You know, you go a wee bit further back. I remember that media, Br- Bratislava, uh, gave us an absolute pace and away from home. Nusha tells Amax. They were embarrassing. But this, like you say, is just showing you this is a competition you're in. That's where you're at. You're not even good enough to be performing at this level. Paul, Paul John, I just, say, I just say one thing, by the way. You go back and watch the highlights. We were incredibly lucky it was six. Yeah, I know. Incredibly I know. lucky it was six. Could easily have been nine. Easily. Not for a bit of good fortune and a bar and a post here and there. Um, it, you know, that they had some very seriously good chances over and above uh, those that they put in the net. So... Yeah. And don't don't get me wrong, they, they scored some great goals, but we were just swamped. Yeah, so we we offered nothing really. So we they were they were all over us that second half. Um, all of my notes are about them. You know, I've got notes about our subs coming on. What did they do well? They didn't do anything really, other than you know they didn't change anything because uh, the, the 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 flow of the play carried on as it was. Uh, and it just didn't change a thing. Uh, so we were outmanned and outgunned, um, and it was painful, absolutely painful to watch. And at some point, you think, even at 3-0, you think, and, and I hate second-guessing managers' tactics, but you, you do really sort of think, Jesus, just put all the centre-halves on. You know, just let's stop pretending we're getting anything out of this. Yeah, you know, let, let's try and stem the, the tide, and uh, it was uh, it was really painful to watch, to be honest with you. And I, I'm I'm sick of uh, using words like you know frustrating and stuff like that to try and be reasonable. Absolutely raging. It was raging last night, raging this morning, and there's other there's other things that happened there as well within that. But it really, is a six now. I mean, we are so much better than that. You know that is uh, that is Safeco territory. We are so much better than that, uh, and uh, you know we should be better than that in Europe with the resources that we have. I don't care what's happened historically in terms of the other pumpings we've got, as I say, because those were different times, different circumstances. You know, we're sitting there, as Patrick says, we we have, you know, there's dragons sitting in their mountains of rubies, you know, and gold, uh, watching devastation on the pitch and just. Sitting there thinking more rubies, more gold, and uh, mm-hmm. let's just you know, let's just keep on hoarding. Uh, it's, I, I don't know. It's, You're right. It's very difficult got... to articulate uh, the annoyance uh, sufficiently. I think. Yeah, I mean, you've got all that money. You you do have the finances. It's not about emptying a bank account for the sake of it. There's a lot of people coming in talking about recruitment. We will get to that. We'll get to Brendan Rogers, uh, both his decisions last night, and also what he must be thinking moving into January, what we must do in January. And then maybe some of the, the bigger aspects of this in relation to the board, how are they performing, not just on the balance sheet, but in terms of um, what they're doing to improve and enhance Celtic's standing uh, in Europe, what they're doing to uh, tackle some of the big issues domestically. Um, and obviously there's the, the third issue at the moment. All this is raging on um, with uh, the, the fractured nature of the relationship with uh, our ultra group, the Green Brigade. So there's loads of things to, to talk about because unity is what Brendan Rodgers has mentioned time and time again. European aspirations, John, when your old fellow was playing, um, and I remember speaking to your, your dad about the uh, often forgotten semi-final that we got to, um, you know, where we should have beaten MTK Budapest and we were 3 nothing up and they beat us 4 nothing away from home. We then had the Liverpool European Cup uh, Winners' Cup semi-final where they beat us and there was uh, the Bobby Lennox goal that should have stood. And and I keep saying this: we weren't a fluke team that got lucky in Europe. Um, we had run after run after run. There were very few actually over that period of over a decade where 
we didn't perform famously. Dynamo Kiev knocked us out the season after we won the tournament, John. But I keep saying it. If you look at 60, 40, 76, 12 seasons, on nine occasions we got to at least the European stage, uh, the, the quarterfinal stage of European competition, on nine occasions. And that includes the two prior to the European Cup win in 1967. That was our European aspiration to be at the latter stages back then. What is it now, John? What do you think it is now as a club? Well, you know, as much as I am uh, appreciative of all the respect my old man and his compatriots get, the fact that we still laud, you know, what is that, 57 years? I don't I can't even, 58, 56, can't remember. 56, yeah. 56 yeah. years. Um, uh, and that's still uh, our main achievement, um, I think, really sums it up, probably. Uh, you know, obviously there was fine the next year. We don't talk about that in my house. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, look, I don't want to bore everyone by repeating the things that I've been saying this entire season. And I, I've been saying them um, since the window closed and before the window closed. I've been saying them since Brendan arrived. I, I said at the time, look, the most important thing that Brendan said in that um, interview of the press conference that he gave um, was that uh, they have set some uh, targets for Europe. Um, but there was no indication of what that was or what that meant. Um, and subsequently, that's very clearly not the case. Um, uh, and I thought that was the single most important thing that he said, that Europe was a, was a priority. Uh, and uh, they were going to, you know, obviously have uh, designs on that. And in terms of managing expectations, that's pretty much the worst thing he could have said, uh, because it really, really then just does set you off going off fantastic at last. Because as I have said more times than I can count on here, show me the plan. Show me what our aspirations are in Europe. You're you're telling me that the, the part of the game which, from which we derive the majority of our income mm -hmm. uh, in terms of playing side, we have no targets. We have no plan. So we have no plan for stabilisation. We have no plan for growth. We have no plan for expansion. And the thing is, you know, as, as, uh, the game of football has proven quite dramatically in the last number of years you're standing still, you're going backwards at a rate of knots. If you're not progressing, you are regressing massively because everything else that's happening around you is firing forward uh, so dramatically. Uh, you know, you get things like then the Saudis are coming out and all the rest of it. You know, what's going to happen in Europe? How's that going to progress? If we're not at the table, if we're not even to be spoken of, if we're not eating the crumbs even, from the European table, when that European league does reform, you know, when that idea comes back and it can't be resisted this time, we're going to be nowhere. We're going to be nowhere. We could be relegated to a backwater permanently. Right? So, you know, we don't have any plans as far as I can see. They've never been made public. Why haven't they been made public? There's no accountability as far as I can see. Does the man manager have targets? What's his targets? Beyond Christmas, is that it? Uh, is that is that, do we know if he's failed then, or are the club are the club just happy that he's there? The manager doesn't tell us the targets. The club don't tell us the targets. Uh, the fans are completely in the dark. What is it that we're trying to achieve? We don't know. So the, the club don't want us, I'm sure, to be frustrated and angry and all the rest of it. They just don't tell us what's happening. We don't know what's happening. Uh, so you're you're left to draw your own conclusions. My conclusions are, and have been for quite some time, until Brendan opened his mouth and um, let, let me a merry, merry dance again, a merry dance of expectation and a bit of excitement. But the, the inevitable conclusion, given our away uh, forum in the Champions League and our general forum in the Champions League, is that they don't have any plans. They don't care. They are just there. Exactly as you said, they are happy to exist in that environment, yeah. that is it. They're there for the TV money. They couldn't care less about what happens. Couldn't care less about the fans paying fortunes. Couldn't care less 
about our expectations and our hopes for the club. And that's the thing about being fans. We're not the PLC. We are fans. We love the club. And I think we're realistic, John. We're not sitting here, you know, saying, right, we need to spend 50 million in a, a transfer window and we, we're going to be in the latter stages of this tournament. We know the restrictions of the Scottish game, um, the fact that this is our main income stream. If you play in another league, you know, our finances are dwarfed by much smaller clubs and richer leagues. And we know all that. But the one hint that I keep going back to, Patrick, and I, and I will continue to go back to it because I think the boardroom is stale. I think it lacks creativity, um, diversity of thoughts and ideas. Remember Ian Bankier, and I think maybe Declan was at this fans forum, and Ian Bankier, yes, I know he's left the club, but the rest of them are still there, and he was replaced by someone who used to be there. So, you know, it's not as if we've got new blood in the room, Patrick. Um, and I think that Ian back here uh, let his guard down, didn't he? And he spoke about the fact that, nah, we can't compete at this level. It was almost as if, what's the point? You know, let's win the league and you get that wee bonus at the end and that bonus is the money you get from the Champions League, even though we're getting embarrassed in the Champions League, even though fans, like we opened the show with, talking about are, you know, spending a lot of money. Some of them won't have it. Some of it will be getting banged on credit cards, all that kind of stuff. Some of them won't have the uh, holiday entitlement, and some of them will be falling out with their respective partners as a result of these uh, trips. And the next one will just be in the post uh, to Rome as well. Despite all of that, um, Ian Bankier said that we cannot compete. It was almost a, a resignation that we can't compete, so why try, Patrick? Um, and then you've got somebody with the ambition and the drive and the methodical kind of approach to his game that, that Brendan Rodgers has. And he's talking about his aspirations and you're kind of hoping there's a unity there um, and everybody's on the same page. But I've got my doubts now, Patrick. Yeah, it's um, it's it's hard to know where to go when you've got guys at the club who you seemingly can't get rid of. I mean, you can't get rid of these guys. These guys are liked by Desmond and Lowell and you, you can go along to the AGM and use you know the, the sort of small uh, shareholding that individual supporters have and you can vote against these guys in the room. But then ultimately they get re-voted in by their pals who actually control the club. So you've got these guys who have been there for 10, 15 years. As you say, no creativity, um, no real ambition either. Happy to just compete, take the 35 million and just lose six games. And they, they've got no ambition at all. And, you know, I believe um, Willie Hohe said in an interview you, you uh, held about a month ago, I think he was of a similar view. He said that we're doing really well to actually be in the Champions League. and. I, ref I refuse to believe that when you rewatch that Lazio game. Lazio were really, really poor that night, and we could have we could have won that game. Um, Feyenoord away, I didn't think Feyenoord were exceptional. Obviously, you're unlucky just before half time. You get two guys sent off. It's a bit of a freak uh, game, but I, I still think you should be going into games like that hoping to try and get a draw. Um, so I don't think you, you can't compete at this level. If you look back to last season, should have beat Shakhtar twice. Should have got six points. Totally yes. underperformed. The, the idea that we can't compete is ludicrous, um, because we we should have we should be competing with our current squad. Never mind if we took it seriously. If we took it seriously, you could be on six, seven, eight, nine points, and who knows where you end up. Um, but the thinking has to be different, and we don't know what the thinking is. Um, I think after I think it was going to the Lazio game, Brendan said in a, a press conference he wants European football after Christmas, so that appears to be the target. Johnson said it on Monday night in an interview with Celtic TV. So we failed because it would take a, a set of several miracles for us to get the Europa League uh, with two games to go. So what are the consequences for failing? How do we prefer, prepare for next year? Obviously, step one is to win the league. Um, but, you know, even when we're going through qualifiers under Dyler, under uh, Lennon, we left the transfers to the last minute, didn't take the yeah. qualifiers seriously, passed up in 30 million quid. And now that we're in, we seem to be passing up on the chance. I think it's something like three, four million quid to win a game. You get mm. a million quid for a draw. And we're passing up all this money. You get more for a draw than you do for winning about five League Cups. And yet we seem to prioritise, you know, domestic trophies, which we all yeah. love, to be fair. But there's much more money at stake in the Champions League. And we never take it seriously. We haven't taken it seriously since Gordon Strachan left, in my opinion. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know how to fix it without actually getting these guys out of the boardroom and getting the people responsible for poor recruitment 
and small time thinking out the club. The big thing is, and, and I hear it all the time, you know, people say, oh, be careful what you wish for. Uh, look at how well run it is. Look at the balance sheet. I get all that side of things. I know that the business needs to run properly and they are running that side of things properly. But um, as I say, it's still, the boardroom is still. Listen, if we start talking about this um, on the night of the Atletico Madrid game last time round at 2-2, every single person in the comments would say, why are you being negative, right? But after a 6 nothing annihilation, because that's what it was, I think it's only right that these things come to the fore, John. And, you know, I, I say to you, if there is any kind of positive from this, is that we bring these things back to the fore. We discuss them again. You know, we have been discussing them since day one on a Celtic state of mind. If you go right back, all the archive episodes are on the YouTube, even before you had the pleasure of seeing what we looked like and it was just audio. They're all on there. And we were speaking six and a half years ago, Kevin Graham and I, about European aspirations. And we're still talking about it right now. I'm really keen to hear what everybody's saying in the comments section on a day like today. Pablo67, welcome to the show. Qualifying for the Champions League is the board's only plan. That's the problem here. Yeah, happy to take the money. And uh, not sufficiently reinvest it in the playing squad, I don't think. I think that many people would agree with that. I want to talk about recruitment in just a moment. Martin McGarrigal, right, one. Rogers still attacking as we were dismantled last night. Just shows he doesn't have it in Europe. Two, the board also need to start to buy those £9 million signings again in January. Right, a couple of points you've raised there, Martin, and I think they're worthy of discussion, certainly. At this moment in time, Brennan Rodgers did a few things wrong last night, John. I would agree with Martin, but I'm not writing him off. I mean, he took a, a club like Leicester, um, not only to FA Cup glory, but to the semi-final of a European competition. We can scoff at the Conference League. We're nowhere near getting to the semi-finals of any European competition, John. I, 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 honestly, I mean, do me a favour, the, 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 Brendan Rodgers. Was Brendan Rodgers playing last night? Do you know what I mean? Was. It's, uh, you know, there's always a sort of tendency to overstate in these games what the manager can do during a game. Um, I'm sure he did make mistakes last night, but by God, your, your heart uh, pushed to pick them out from the absolute shambles that was on the pitch. Uh, and I'm not blaming the players either. You know, let, let's just be absolutely clear. Uh, the last Atletico game, the first half was probably the best I've seen us play in years. Yeah, absolutely probably. years. Yeah. And we uh, managed to come out of that with a draw to the great credit of those players. But as I said at the time, those guys were all fantastic on the night. Everything yeah. fell for them. They did brilliantly. They were playing miles above themselves. They were playing at the absolute extreme limits of their physical and skill capabilities, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so what do you expect them to do then? Just keep on producing that? It was a one-off. Do you know what I mean? These guys, uh, they, they came out. We know it was a one-off because it's the best we've played in years. And right, we probably so, suffered for a couple of games after it, John, oh, because we, we took it to that did. level. You know, We absolutely did. You could see people saying, oh, they should be able to play 90 minutes. Again, do me a favour. There's 90 minutes and then there's 90 minutes. 90 minutes against Hamilton Aki's isn't a 90 minutes against Atletico Madrid where you are emptying yourself. You are absolutely emptying the time. You're giving everything you can, both attitude and physically. Um, and, you know... That was like that is a one off. That's as good as these guys could do. It's as well as they could do, uh, and there was no way that that was uh, the chances of that being repeated away from home were slim. Best case scenario last night, I reckon we get out of there with a two 0 defeat, right? Best case scenario because they were going to turn up. They weren't not going to turn up twice, so they were going to turn up, and we saw their quality last night. We're, we're not even touching the sides of that. Um, and that is a tremendous quality they have. I mean, that boy Griezmann, geez, if I never hear his name again, it'll be too soon. Uh, you know, but they, they were absolutely sensational. Uh, some of the goals he scored were fantastic, but of course mm -hmm. we are giving them the run of the park. And the, their ability to pick out space when we are down to 10 was just unbelievable. I mean, they, you know, they were, but they were picking out guys even when there wasn't space. It was just ridiculous stuff. So, I mean, look, they're far too good for us. 
Um, our guys did their very best. I'm not blaming the players. What I'm saying is, and what I've been saying prior to the window closing all summer, is that we have to do better with the recruitment. We have mm -hmm. to. Uh, we spoke about all the different positions, and that wasn't even, you know, we weren't, we weren't even talking about bringing things up to a Champions League standard. We were just saying these are the obvious defects. These are the obvious areas where we need cover. Uh, and we didn't even get that sorted. You know, so we brought in, I don't know, 120 project players, uh, some of whom will be out the building before we even remember their names. Uh, you know, again, you know, I'm going to have to repeat myself just for the basis of, you know, people in the comments don't necessarily always listen and all the rest of it. But nobody's saying sign ridiculous price players. Nobody's saying, you know, play, you know, sign guys for 15 million and we couldn't afford their wages or we'd need to smash the wage structure or all the rest of it. Because there's a good chance you end up like that Phillips, you know, something like that happens. Um, and, you know, tell me if, whether you think he's worth three times the salary of some of your boys. Now, the point is, when we are being successful, we need to be recruiting on an increasing gradient of potential. And we've repeat, sorry, Patrick, sorry, Paul, I'm repeating myself again here, but we are we need to be increasing on an increasing gradient of potential. So instead of your signings, your your prospect signings being one and a half to three and a half million, right? You're signing guys for six million. Absolutely. Yeah, you're Five much to seven. better yeah. prospects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you just step up gradually. No one's saying do something ridiculous and break the bank. That's just nonsense. That's not even a suggestion. You know, again, the wage structure couldn't tolerate it, but we need to be signing better prospects. And we cannot just keep, as I've said more times than I can count, resetting to zero every year. Every year it's as if we haven't made any progress. Every year. The board have got treated this year as if we're skint. You know, there has been no acknowledgement at all on the field that we've got this money in the bank. Just none. It didn't stop them. They didn't rethink for a second. You know, the signing policy. They didn't think, well, we should be signing anyone better. No, we'll just keep signing these lads at three million, three and a half million, uh, and hope one of them turns into a world ch uh, champion. It, it's just it's so frustrating. It, it, that is not a business model, and it is not a model for growth. It is not a model for potential. It is not a model to see us progress. Uh, all we're doing is resetting. And while we are doing that and hanging on for dear life and whatever. European competition that we're in, the rest of the world's passing us by. We are going to be left for dead, you know, and it's just, it's so not good enough. And the board, yeah, no, look, things could be much worse. We could be, as someone said, we could be, you know, uh, we could be owned by a, you know, a multi, uh, a, a, a state owned, uh, you know, uh, company that is essentially washing blood money. Uh, so, you know, things could be worse, but for the guys that are there just now, we only have that to talk about. And the fact they're constantly saying things could be worse doesn't get you anywhere no. in life or in business. You know, if you're going into your boss every day and he's saying, do you hit your targets? And you're going, no, but don't worry, things could be worse. We could I be might not have turned up, I know. Do you know what I mean? I, I, see how far you get. I might have pulled a see second. Ah, it could have been worse. You know, it's, no, it's, it's an absolute nonsense, man. It, it, it's defeatist, you know, the, the constant excuses and, oh, I don't expect us to do anything in Europe. Well, you should, because we are a club who are proud history, and we should be doing things in Europe. Um, we should be competing in Europe. And it's, we don't, and you can't even pretend, oh, look, we don't have the resources. We do. We have the resources. So I, I don't accept the defeatist attitude. I don't accept the, the approach of the board, whether it's to the business model or to recruitment. Um, and I, I just, I, I don't accept the fact that we can't compete in Europe. And it, it really offends me whenever you hear the likes of, you know, Bank here or Billy Hall here, anyone just saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll never do anything. You know why we'll never do anything? Because we're not trying to do anything. You know, and as, the thing uh, is, was, was that, that was the old Homer Simpson joke, wasn't it? You know, if at first you don't succeed, just don't try. You know, that was the... Uh, it's, uh, do me a favour. Anyway. But competing, this is the thing. Competing, we're not sitting here saying competing is getting into semis and, and finals of the Champions League. Last night is certainly not competing. 
you know, competing in this competition is not last night. It's not getting pumped 6 nothing. Now, Matt Lobo was the head of first team scouting and recruitment at Celtic. And I think you've got to, yeah, you've got to question elements of last night's performance. Of course you do. You look at Brendan Rodgers, could he have made more changes? John was saying, get some more defenders on. Yeah, it seemed to work. We showed it up against Atletico Madrid the first time round. We didn't do that. One of our best, in fact, the best player this season, Matt O'Reilly, was anonymous. There are certain things on the night that didn't go well, but there are deeper, there are deeper issues. Um, and when you're looking at the recruitment, let's go back to the summer. Let's go back to the summer. And we've entered that summer window um, in a situation where we've lost three first-team players. One through uh, retirement uh, with Aaron Moy, who was a very important player for us last season. Starfelt leaves because he wants to be closer to his partner. That's that's fair enough. But he was a very, very important part of the defence. And that partnership they had with Carter Vickers was solid. And Jota, star man, he leaves and we get all this unexpected money for him, right? So you go into that transfer window. This was not a transfer window to go in and basically experiment. It was not a transfer window to go out and buy half a dozen guys that might be good in 18 months' time. What did we do? So we're bought in home. I think home's a very good player. Two and a half million quid. Loads of promise, 20 years of age. Is he one of these guys, though, Patrick, that you're looking at and saying instant impact? I think he's looked all right, but he's not an instant impact player. He is the other type. He is the guy that you develop at that age, at that profile. So he is that type of player on the left-hand side. And then you've got uh, Marco Tilio, um, AWOL at the moment. He's fit, apparently. Who knows what's happening there? You've got Yang, who's coming from, and I think, by the way, coming from South Korea with a bit of uh, credibility and calibre over there. Um, yeah, you know, is he an instant impact player? It, it, it uh, remains to be seen. You've got Kwon. We've never seen him since the preseason friendly. I think the last game he played was in a testimonial. You've got Naroski, Barely seen him through injury. Uh, he's now fit, by the way. Didn't make the bench. Lagerbjelk. Rogers clearly doesn't rate him because he's been fit and he's not been getting paid. Uh, played rather. Palmer. Yeah, he's made an impact. That's one. Nat Phillips on the bench. He'll be going back to Liverpool in, in January. Bernardo, he's a loan deal and he looks like a useful enough player. Is that good enough? Have we replaced the three guys we've lost, Patrick? I would say no. That's For me, if you're the head of recruitment, you've failed. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, again, not got, not got a lot of problems with some of the players. Home looks a good player, contributed. Two and a half million, not much of a problem. I imagine he'll be in relatively low wages as well, which I think is important because when you're talking with guys like Nat Phillips, I mean, he'll be on mega bucks and that's just bad value for money. You need to get value for money. It's all well and good having 70 million, um, but we're not just asking the board to spend it willy nilly. We're asking them to invest it properly. And home, you know, it remains to be seen if he's a good investment, but he's, he's done all right so far, promising. Um, Yang, I like Yang, but, you know, it is the middle of November now and he's been given a lot of chances don't think he's scored yet um, I think he played well he's been playing well recently but again you know is that the calibre player that we should be going for Quan, absolute you know who knows what's going on there um, played against Atletico uh, Atletico Val sorry in the friendly um, looked rotten hasn't been seen since mm -hmm. uh, Laga Belka shaky start was never exceptional and again not been seen since. I think he was on the bench last night, as you said. Norovsky's not in the squad, to be fair. Um, but again, he he get injured after two games. You know, he's allegedly a brilliant player, but again, he's only played two games, four million quid spent. So remains to be seen. Lagabelka as well. I'm pretty sure we signed him from a second division team, which is, you know, that's a bit of a risk, is it not? Is that the type of market we should be shopping in? Um, Same with Quan. Quan he doesn't look second tier. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean. <laughs> And I think this goes back further than just this summer. I mean, you look at last Agreed. season, and we can all talk about Angie's great recruitment, but apart from Alistair Johnson, you're sort of questioning who actually came in. I mean, Kobayashi, he's nowhere near the team. Uh, Moy, retired after a year. Hank Zabanovich, I don't rate him at all. I know some people do, but he was sent away um, to Stoke, and I don't think he's set the world alight down there either. Um, you know, O might become a player, but again... He's been here for almost a year. Um, so there's a lot of questions over recruitment and it, it really hasn't been good enough. Um, and as John says, you know, 10 years ago, I think I said this a few weeks ago, 10 years ago, we're bringing in 8 million for Hooper, 10 million for Magidi and spending 2, 3 million on Pookie and Barrichter. And, you know, you might get lucky with a one year. Barrichter, did so you have to? We've already mentioned Nusha Telzamax <laughs> and you bring up Dirk Barrichter. Patrick, 
as if it was and nowadays yeah you're bringing in uh, you know alan morrison highlighted it as well you know both Feyenoord and celtic brought in 31 million euros in the summer Feyenoord spent 31 million euros i think we spent 17 you know and we we brought in 31 million from two player sales which not get a problem with you know um i think starfield's come out saying he didn't really want to go um you know it's, it's tricky to know what, what went on there but um you know jota 25 million you can't turn that down fair enough but we need to be reinvesting the money and we don't mm-hmm. it, again it's like europe we don't appear to have a concise strategy we thought we did under range it sort of went a bit wayward second season and then we seem to be back to the scattergun approach this season of um we'll spend about 15 20 million but it will be sort of all over the place you know um we've signed a lot of guys this season with a lot of guys last season abelgard is another one that comes to mind they make absolutely no contribution and we get lucky with guys like palmer every so often and aaron boy and you know it, it's it's hard to know where they go from here really isn't it i mean on one hand you're dominating domestically on the other hand it's an absolute disaster in europe yeah and, and by the way you know when you're not under that intense pressure john to defend and defend and defend and and you know we give great credit uh, to to the guys that are performing at the moment, Liam Scales, Carl Vickers, we've been you know singing our praises for uh, weeks, and in particular Scales. And by the way, I thought he, you know he certainly wasn't the worst player on the park last night. But they're not used, John, to that level of intensity when it comes to attacking and us having to defend like that last night. So our position has to be that the quality is there, so that they can step up. Because once we come into come into that uh, contact with that level of team. There's players in there who they might be able to cut it domestically, but that's a massive step up, and it's maybe a bridge too far for some of them. And I'm not singling out Carter Vickers or Scales here, by the way. I just used them as an example for uh, for another. Well, for another it's, a, it's a perfect example, though. It's a perfect example because essentially, you know, against Ross County, they could have both played at striker. Sure, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they, no, they no pressure. Certainly. Yeah, they weren't no playing pressure. in defence. I, mean, I don't think. I don't think either of them were behind their halfway line. They were all in the final third, pretty much, of Ross County for almost the entire game. Yeah. So that is, you know, and then in those circumstances, they're getting pelters for not having the distribution of some sort of wonder midfielder because they're getting the ball so much, you know, and you're expecting them to come up with absolute perlers every time they breach a, a packed defence. And they go from that to basically running for their lives uh, against some of the best players in the world. Um, that's quite a difference in a few days. Mm. That's quite an adjustment. And it's always been the problem that we have, and it's always been the challenge that we have. But it is the challenge. So you have to step up. Right? You know that you, you know your games against the likes of Ross County, a 10-man Ross County, is not going to be a, a difficult game, potentially. It's not going to be a, an issue. So. You have to be mentally prepared for what's coming. And I think, unfortunately, last night, uh, when we lost the goal, that's, you know, we carried on playing pretty well for the next sort of 15 minutes. Um, and then that ludicrous, nonsense, ridiculous decision. Uh, and uh, we go down to 10. And that just sucked the life out of the team for me. I, I just... You know, I, it, it sucked the belief out of them. I, I just don't think they believed it themselves that there was anything co- good coming. Uh, and again, mentally, what you think they might be thinking is they might be remembering even subconsciously how absolutely wrecked they were after the first game. And, you know, do they want to give that much again uh, for a lost cause? Uh, and even even if you know, I'm saying it just could be subconscious, just like you know, th- th- this took everything from them that last that last game, and um, they're not going to win this. They're not going to get a draw. They all know it. Uh, and you know, do they want to do it again? So you know, again, th- th- there are circumstances there in the, in the game, but the, the the whole thing always you know comes back to uh, the, the, the recruitment. Those that. The last game was the best they could do. This was not the best they could do, and, and a lot of them were exposed. But you're talking about, you know, they, they play in a game like this. The, the problem is they have to play above themselves. 
if they play to uh, the level that they're actually at, that's what happens. You know, yeah. so it would it would have been without a man off. It would have been two or three anyway, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but you know, it, it, it requires our guys to give more than they you know are sometimes capable of in order just to squeak a result. And that yeah, all right. comes back to the same issue. You know, you're saying you you you're going through the list of guys. They are saying, you know, have they made much of an impact? Are they a decent player? Right. How about we sign someone who steps onto the pitch and you just think, player, mm-hmm. no, hands for butts, no, the whole crowd's just going, player, you know, and we can do it, that? John. You know, we can do and, it. And, exactly, we can do it. That's the point. Yeah. That's the point. We can do it, and um, that, that's what makes it so frustrating. Of all the times, you know, we've been skint. We've had you know, Fergus McCann saving the club. We've had issue, you know, a, a miserable time in the nineties, uh, all of that. Uh, against the cheats and then you know we're now in a position of absolute dominance and what have we decided to do with that dominance we've decided to sit in our hands we've decided to do nothing with it we've decided that this is good enough it's good enough for the supporters because it's good enough for the people on the board and the reason we don't keep harping on about the issues with the board is because people get bored with it. They want to talk about the football. It yeah. is not, it is essentially, although it's very important, it's not a, a PLC forum, but the makeup of the board is, is a disgrace. Uh, and uh, bringing the likes of Lowell back was a disgrace uh, against all sort of corporate governance standards. And the, the guys that have just been sitting on there are supposed to be executive or non-executive directors who are supposed to be an impartial voice and they've been there for about 20 years. You know what I mean? They're, they're supposed to be replaced every couple of years. and uh, There are no independent voices. So, you know, essentially, Desmond barks and they do what they're told. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, and Lowell is a conduit for that. Uh, and again, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's sort of frustrating because we know no matter how angry or upset or passionate we get, uh, they will do nothing. This is a frustration because you were talking about when was the last time you got a player who goes in a team and you, you know straight away. And I, I responded, John, saying we, we know we can do it because we actually did it in season one under Ange Poster Coughlin. That was only three seasons ago where we knew that every every signing really had to make an impact. And, you know, Abada, Carol Starfelt, Kyogo, Cameron Carter Vickers, Jota, and then you come into the January, Hatati, Maeda, you know, and you're thinking, O'Reilly, who could forget? And you're thinking, we can do it. Did we become complacent because we won a double, then a treble? Did we become, com- become complacent? History would say yes. Um, Chris Morris, aka AGSC Tech. It was never a red card. The boy actually uh, bluters the ball at Maeda and he actually moves his foot forward, Maeda. And their feet collide. Sorry, well, that's been yeah, uh, in yeah, your sorry. face there, Patrick. You're, you're absolutely right about that. Can I just say that comment? If you watch that back, no matter how many times you watch it back, if my Ada doesn't have his foot up there, that guy takes out his knee. Mm-hmm. Right? So he follows through in that and he taking hits my Ada's knee into the stands. Uh, so if my Ada didn't have his feet up, it'd be him getting stretched off. Um, and would there be any VAR about that? And by the way, uh, clear and obvious, you know, three words, but very important, clear and obvious. That was what VAR was supposed to be for. Mm -hmm. If you look back uh, to the the, the pods we did when it started out, I said exactly this because I saw it happen in the rugby. You know, rugby is my other game, so I saw it happen in the rugby. It's supposed to be a useful tool. And as someone pointed out, it's only a useful tool unless it's well, operated is not operated by useless tools. But the the it's supposed to be a useful tool, but it ends up dominating the game. Mm-hmm. Rug, rugby, for instance, is a very very stop start game like cricket, right? It's you know that's fine. If there's lots of stoppages in the rugby, it doesn't really bother that many people. It's a bit of a pain, but that's fine. But for football, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. It undermines everything that's good about the game. And yeah. that was not a clear and obvious case where they have to come in 
and say, that's a red card. If Maeda goes through him, hits his knee, puts him up into the stands, fair enough. The fact that you can sit and debate it, if it's debatable, if the ref saw it, gave a yellow, then it's debatable. It's not clear and obvious and absolutely should not have required the intervention of VAR. And we've now got a situation where VAR is refereeing the game and the guy on the pitch is just, uh, he's just communicating the will of the VAR officials in a van out the back or whatever they are, the HQ somewhere. Uh, but that is not what it was intended for. No. It wasn't intended to referee the game. It was intended to aid the referees. And the thing is, John, um, and again, this is one of the great things about social media. There's there's some drawbacks on it, some negative things about it. But, you know, people do capture some of the other moments of the game, uh, some that you may have missed because they've not gone to VAR and, and you don't see the, the replay from every angle. But there's a tackle against Kugel, Patrick. There's a tackle on Alistair Johnson that looked just as bad as the one that made a put in. Didn't even go to VAR. I mean... I also think that very, very quickly players and management find a way to manipulate the fact that VAR's there. And I mean, Rogers obviously seen it last night with the reaction to Simeone. And it's like the pressure then comes on to review it as well. So they found a way very quickly, footballers, to manipulate the situation, roll about like mad, thinking to yourself, you know, this might go to VAR because but we're going to put a wee bit of doubt in the minds of everybody that's involved here. I thought it was a ludicrous decision, uh, looking back on it. I asked the question last night. Kevin McCluskey responded exactly the same. Um, and, you know, when you watch it again this morning, um, in the cold light of day, knowing what, what has gone on, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not clutching here. I'm not looking for excuses here. But in isolation, I thought it was a bad decision. Um, and I think VAR is really sucking the life out of the game as well. Patrick, and it's no Scottish football. I can see it online with people all over Europe speaking about that in the same kind of same kind of terms. Um, but it, it's clearly here to say it's here to stay, Patrick, isn't it? I mean, what was your thought on the red card last night? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a red card. Uh, when you see the still image, it looks like a red card. But when you see it, I mean, it doesn't even have to be in real time. At, at slow motion, you know, it's not a red card because he's went to kick the ball and the the, the feet collide. Only in that one still image does it look like a red card. And, you know, John's right, VAR has not been used how it's intended to be used. I'm pretty sure these reviews, you know, it's for big decisions. Fair enough, they've stuck to that rule. The reviews aren't meant to take more than 60 seconds. That's well out the window. There were reviews down in England and often in Scotland they take two, three, four minutes. You know, it, it wound up and you no know, end. It still does uh, from that Tottenham Chelsea game on Monday night. Um, and then, as John says, it's only as good as the people using it. And as we know in Scotland, and as we knew last night, I mean, the referees are absolutely hopeless. Uh, the the one at Tynecastle last October, the handball, is this the, the, the very first game VAR was used in Scottish football, and they missed a, an obvious handball. So it, it doesn't work if the people don't use it correctly, and it's used far too often. Um, the, the other issue is every time you go to the monitor, you know it's going to get overturned, yeah. which seems to be some sort of issue. I don't know why that. I don't know why that happens. I'm not sure why the referee is incapable of thinking for himself. Because um, when he goes over to that monitor, he should see that that isn't a red card. And you've got to draw the conclusion that that guy's a poor referee. Because we, we had him, um, I want to say, eight and a half years ago against Inter Milan at the San Siro. Uh, Van Dijk gets sent off incorrectly. And he booked so many Celtic players that we get fined out of disciplinary. Uh, and we, we lodged a complaint. And... Um, you know, he's he's made his way from the Europa League to the Champions League. Uh, so it's 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 a question of referee and it's a question of R um in terms of last night anyway, because th there's no way that's a red card. And as you say, it's it's probably here to stay far, but there's so many decisions now that you just wonder, right, it's taking too long, it's the incorrect decision and it's stopping the game. Um it's I'm not a fan at all. Not a fan at no. all. No, absolutely not. Um, the other thing as well is, you know, in order to to improve, obviously there's things we can do, John. It's whatever's in your your kind of circle of influence. And uh, one of the things is bringing players in to improve the squad. Uh, we could probably dedicate several shows to whether or not that's happened in the last three transfer windows. Um, and then every so often you get that wee nugget. You get an Alistair Johnston, perhaps a Palmer. Um, and I'm not writing... Uh, guys like uh, Holm or, or Yang or, or O off because I think they've shown enough that they could well be prospects, but they're not immediate impact players. And this is the 
this you've got there. And then as soon as we do get a player, John, be that a first-team player like Matt O'Reilly being the, the next example perhaps, or a youth player like Ben Doak or you know several others, you could actually put a whole team of guys that have left without kicking a ball for Celtic. I know Doak got a few minutes. We can't keep them. We're in a situation, John, where we just don't have the ability, or do we, to keep them at the club any longer. So not only are we tourists in the Champions League, we're on, we're also just being used as a platform for guys to to come along and get a bigger and, and more lucrative move. Um, and whilst we're in Scotland, John, that's not going to change either, is it? No, uh, but again, there, there are elements of things that we have done well. So you, you put them on a long-term contract. Mm. Uh, now, that works for, uh, again, the, the better players, so we're able to hold on to them or at least extract maximum amount of money. It works relatively well for um, the, the players who turn out not to be so good because you're punting them on anyway, whether they want to go or not, because they're never going to see, uh, they're never going to get their studs on your football pitch um, unless they move on. And unless you're James McCarthy, that's a problem for most people. Now, uh, so there are elements to that that work out well for us, but we can hold on to them. We're always going to be cycling through certain players, which is why we have to be bringing in quality and not quantity. We don't need 35-odd players. We don't need a, a, a squad that's so big we don't even need to uh, fill it for Europe. You know, I think in all of Ange's time, I, I think he, he used like a maximum of 17 players. Um, and the only reason we're going to use more now is just because of how many centre halves we had injured, and that was a freak incidence, uh, which is unlikely to ever happen again. But we need a core group of quality, uh, and you know, we need the kind of players who, when they're not playing, you're very worried about losing their quality, especially at Champions League level. You're just thinking, "Ah, oh, geez, he's so important to us." You know, at, at, at this level, at the kind of level they were at last night, there's not a single player we have uh, that, that stacks up against that. Um, so, again, you don't want to be unreasonable. There are restrictions on us. You don't. I mean, again, I, I'm 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 passionate, but I'm passionate about the things that we can control. I'm not a dreamer. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I believe. You know, I I'm a businessman. I, you know, I believe I can see what the business is trying to do. I can see what the business is trying to achieve. Um, I just think they're doing it very badly uh, and not achieving anything. And I don't think they have the basic things in place because they don't have to, because they don't have to tell us anything. So they're just happy going on their way, uh, taking the dividends. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, they'll be happy doing that. Uh, there are, you know, I, again, our guys have a real problem with, um, you know, uh, stepping up. But, the issue, as you're saying, Paul John, is if the likes of Matt O'Reilly plays a blinder all year, will he be gone in the summer? Almost certainly. Mm -hmm. Almost certainly. And what are we going to replace him with? Three, Another three guys. Half million pounds. Yeah. yeah. Three guys at three million. Yeah. Do you know what I yeah. mean? And you know, are we even going to attempt to get uh, someone as good as him in? And, and you know, you think the matter really didn't even cost a pile of money. But we went from that initial recruitment, as as both you and Patrick have pointed out very well. Our, all of the guys, pretty much, that we have now were recruited uh, very soon into Angie's tenure. Uh, and we haven't really seen much success since then. So no. I, I don't know who was making recommendations or had those up their sleeves. Uh, but we've also gone from signing Japan's best player and putting them on the bench to signing guys from the Korean second division. Uh, you know, so where, where does that, exactly how much potential, you know, do you think you have to be shown in order to get signed for us? Uh, so, look, there, there are a number of issues that we face uh, and the my frustration uh, is that the, the the parts that we can control, we choose not to control. It is a choice, right? There are certain things that we can't deal with. We, you know, we, we can't control the outside world, but we can control what we do, what Celtic mm -hmm. do, and we choose not to do better. You're right. I mean, by the way, uh, I know he's been chatting uh, over the last few days, but 
not only did we lose Moy and Jota and Starfield, I think we lost a, a fair bit of quality in Yakamakis and Juranovic. And, yeah. you know, they, these guys might have wanted to leave, I get it. But y- you've got to then say, right, have we have we successfully replaced them? Um, is O a like-for-like like improvement or, or even a match for, for Yakamakis? There's a debate. Is Johnston... It's a very um, short I, debate, I, Paul John. It's a I, very I short debate. <laughs> yeah, we could finish that before the end of the show. Um, and and Juranovic, you know, versus versus Johnson, we bring in Johnson, he's younger, I get it. But we have lost quality, John. There's five players we've mentioned, of, of real quality that we've lost. And then you're bringing other guys into that squad almost as filler. One final point, and yeah, it's a wee bit deeper, but the recruitment policy is one thing. Uh, youth recruit, You know, youth recruitment and development is another. Because we bring in a player like um, Quan, for example, to use an example, uh, he's 22 years of age. 22 years of age, and he's played 80 games of senior football, many of which were in the second tier of South Korea. Why can't we produce a 22-year-old midfielder to do what, what Quan has done, which is absolutely nothing at the moment? And that's a frustration for me, because I do think that uh, we are producing players and they're just, they don't see a pathway and they leave. And I'm hoping Vata is not the next and the long line of young guys that have left because he does have talent. Listen, we could go on all day. It's uh, not great after a 6 nothing win, but these are points that need to be discussed. Hopefully we can dust ourselves down tomorrow and start uh, looking ahead to Sunday's game against Aberdeen. Uh, but these issues will remain and we will have to discuss them between now and January. What will we do in January? I think you've got to do better and you've got to try and keep uh, Brendan Rodgers happy because let's not forget he's for me, the best calibre of coach we can have at this moment in time. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved. 1,200 strong on a Wednesday. A lot of frustration in the comments section. Thanks, everybody, for, for getting involved in the chat. And thank you to John Hughes and to Patrick McGill for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Yeah, yeah.